Uh, it's good to be with you again today, and I uh, hope you're having a blessed day. Um, I pray that you have a blessed week, um, and that all of you are uh, well. I know that there are many challenges um, to the people that uh, I share with, um, but there's no greater honor. And, uh, and so let's continue our study. We're going through the book of Genesis. Um, we are beginning today the last three lessons in the book of Genesis. Um, today we are in Genesis 49. This will be a single lesson chapter. Uh, chapter 50 will be a two lesson chapter. And then we will end about a three year series. Um, so Genesis chapter 49, the title is Mixed Blessings. The era of the patriarchs is ending. Jacob is dying. He is passing the baton to Joseph. Uh, but there is other business to tend to. There's 11 other sons. And so let's get started. Verse 11, or verse 1 rather, says, And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Now, uh, Jacob knows he's nearing the end of his time on earth. That's obvious. He also knows that the information that he is about to give to his sons is inspired by God. We'll see that as we go along. Jacob will speak to each son, pronouncing an oracle on his sons. Now, I've talked about oracles before. Oracles can be positive. Uh, that's what we call a blessing. Oracles can also be negative. That's what we call a cursing. And at times, we're going to wonder here which one of those we're actually reading. But these oracles, I think, are actually not intended to pronounce as much as they are to reveal. In other words, Jacob makes it clear that these are prophecies. These are, quote, what shall befall you in the last days, end quote. You know, it's been said this is the first conscious prophecy by man in the Bible. Uh, before this, we, we read prophecies, but we read only prophecies by God or by man who is unknowing that they're prophecies at the time. Jacob here refers to himself as both Jacob and Israel. I find that interesting. You know, when you recognize in this life that you're in a battle, a battle of flesh and spirit, it's a clear sign of spiritual maturity. You might say, in a sense, Jacob has arrived. You know, I, I always find it a little bit humorous that most of the times when I begin to get good at something, uh, I discover that it's over, you know, if it's an event or something like that. Um, that makes me think of Jacob here. But do we ever really get good in this battle? Because the battle really ultimately is the Lord's, isn't it? Verse 3, it says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel. Because you went up to your father's bed. And you defiled it. He went up to my couch. You know, dignity and power seems like great virtues. That's how Jacob starts out here. <laughs> but then he goes on and combines all of this with instability and immorality. And so what really happens here is, is a tragedy. The prophecy, you shall not excel. That's the prophecy. It has been and it will continue to be fulfilled. No prophet, no judge, no king will come from Reuben. Jesus spoke of the first being last. Well, that's the life story of Reuben. 
He is indeed unstable as water. Have you ever tried to capture water with your hand? Water always seeks the path of least resistance, the place that is the lowest available. That's what Jacob's referring to here. And God expects us to reach higher than our flesh. God expects us to walk in the Spirit. He expects us to love Him with all of our heart. And He will give us everything we need for life and godliness. Verse 5, it says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man. And in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. You know, th these words here, divide, scatter. Obviously, this is not an oracle of blessing. It is explicitly a curse. Well, really, what it is, it is a curse upon, quote unquote, anger. And isn't that what Paul wrote? He said, be angry and sin not. Now, Jesus was angry, but he, he, he never sinned. Simeon and Levi, on the other hand, were sinfully angry, and the reason is made very plain. Self-will. Instead of yielding the circumstances to God, they took matters into their own hands. These two were selfish and prideful and lethal weapons to men and animals alike, is what we're reading here. It reminds me of that sentence, be sure your sins will find you out. You, know, you may be forgiven, but the consequences of sin can be suffered for a lifetime. Simeon will later start out from Egypt as the third largest tribe of Israel. That's in Numbers 123. But 35 years later, it will be the smallest tribe in Israel. That's in Numbers 26, 14. And eventually, this tribe will share land with Judah. That's in Joshua 19, verse 1. Levi, on the other hand, showed faithfulness during the rebellion of the golden calf in Numbers 26, 14. It's a great lesson because it lets me know when I disobey God, I will suffer for it. But what should I do with that? Should that suffering draw me close to God or should it drive me away from God? I hope we understand the answer to that. Verse 8, Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. Now, we've studied about the birthright privilege. It's uh, twofold. First of all, there is the economical aspect of it, a double portion of inheritance. And second, the birthright privilege is uh, political, the family scepter, in other words, leadership. So economically, politically, double portion, family scepter. It's generally expected these privileges will go to the firstborn son. 
but we've already seen several times in Genesis where they were received by the second son. In the case of Jacob's sons, neither one is the case. The birthright will not go to Reuben, nor Simeon, nor Levi. In fact, the birthright privileges will not even go to just one son. The privileges will be divided. Uh, first of all, Joseph has already received a double portion of the inheritance. Secondly, Judah receives the position of family leadership. So the story of Judah is one of miserable beginnings, you know, unlike the other, but much growth and change. And yet it is not Judah's accomplishment that we look to here. It is actually what we look to here is God's grace. The promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, will come through the tribe of Judah. Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. The son of God is the true honor of Judah. Jesse is not the honor of Judah. The root of Jesse is. David is not the honor of Judah. The Lord of David is. Solomon is not the honor of Judah. As the Bible says, a greater than Solomon is the honor of Judah. It is not the scepter of Judah that we look to. It is, we might say, the Shiloh of Judah. Shiloh is a reference to the Messiah. So moving on, verse 13, Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. So speaking of the sons of Leah, um, he, jump, uh, he jumps here to the tenth. Jacob jumps to the tenth. This phrase here, uh, quote, shall dwell by the haven of the sea, literally means looking toward the sea. And this is exactly what took place with Zebulun. This tribe took the land that was positioned between the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee. And then Issachar, verse 14. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between two burdens. He saw that rest was good and that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. So, uh, you know, this definitely mixed blessings here. Like a donkey, Issachar was large and strong, but he was lazy. And so they made good targets for the bullies in the neighborhood, if you will. They were eventually forced into slavery by oppressive armies. Verse 16, Jacob goes on. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. <laughs> A single verse there, verse 18. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Wow. You know, Samson was a Danite, so the tribe of Dan did indeed judge his people. Samson was considered to be one of the judges, but Dan um, ultimately shows himself to be ruthless and cruel and idolatrous. In fact, Judges 18.30 tells us they introduced idolatry to Israel. They became a center of idol worship. That's in Amos chapter 8, verse 14. I have visited the region where they are, and they still have some remnants of the old altars, pagan altars that they uh, worship false gods on. The Hebrew word here in verse 18 for salvation, I love this verse, the Hebrew word for salvation here is Yeshua. It simply translates into the word Jesus, you know, the anglicized. So right here in the middle of all these, I guess you could say blessings and cursings, all these oracles, Jacob just pauses 
He just pauses and cries out for his, what he called earlier, his redeemer, this, the angel with a capital A. But Jacob calls out for none other than Jesus, God's salvation, our salvation from God. Verse 19, Jacob says, Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Now, Gad was a um, strong tribe, a big blessing to David, actually, in 1 Chronicles 12, 14. But later in Jeremiah, they are oppressed by invading armies. And nevertheless, this verse here tells us that the tribe of Gad will triumph at last. So it's kind of an encouraging prophecy, I think, yet to be fulfilled. Verse 20, it says, bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Isn't it interesting that Moses continues this prophecy here? I say continues because it's from Deuteronomy 33, verse 24. It says, Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers, and let him dip his foot in oil. And then he goes on in verse 20 here in Genesis. It, it, you know, it, it leads into Deuteronomy. Bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Fascinating. Verse 21, Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. This phrase, beautiful words, is very fitting because you see Jesus did much teaching in the region of Naphtali. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, beautiful words indeed. Verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him. But his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your Father who will help you and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lie beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your Father have excelled the blessings of my ancestors. Up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers." Well, it should be no surprise to us that when Jacob comes to his son Joseph, things become very personal. He speaks of Joseph Joseph's difficult but blessed life. And then he speaks of more blessings to come. And then Jacob acknowledges that his life, with all its flaws, was filled with the gracious attention of a loving God. Wow. <laughs> we, we need to wrap around this a little bit. Uh, Jacob, for more, much of his life, he was a conniving rascal. And yet at the end, he says he is more blessed than his ancestors. In fact, Luke 7, 47 tells us, the one who has been forgiven much loves much. Notice the five titles that Jacob ascribes to God. He calls them, first of all, mighty God of Jacob, and then shepherd, and then stone of Israel, and then God of your Father, and finally, Almighty. Verse 27 says, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning he shall devour the prey, and at night he shall divide the spoil. Now there's numerous scriptures that illustrate just how brutal the tribe of Benjamin was, but time is not going to allow me to get into that here. You can, see, uh, you can see Judges chapter 3, verse 15 through 23, um, the story of Ehud, one of the um, judges. Um, Saul in 1 Samuel 9, 1, Samuel 14, 47 to 52, and Paul in Acts 8, 1 through 3, and Judge, uh, uh, Judges 19 to 20. Plenty of examples. 
Verse 28, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them, and he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. Much of what Jacob speaks here, folks, is about his, uh, that, that he is speaking about his sons, is going to become even more clear to us as it is fulfilled in the future. So just reading on quickly, verse 29, it says, Then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife, and there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is there were purchased from the sons of Heth. Now, Jacob's very clear here. He prefers to be buried in a cave in the land of promise than to receive a burial that would have had the honor of a Pharaoh. He is a son of promise and he acts like it. It begs the question, how about you and me? Are, are you a child of promise through Jesus? And can people see that you are? Last verse, verse 33. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. So we have the end of an era. Three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. One commentator said that there are three basic attitudes toward death. Death, death accepting, death denying, and death defying. You know, the ancient Greeks held to the death accepting view. Our world is really sold out to a death denying approach. But Christians should have a death defying attitude. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Um, let's pray. Father in heaven, what a great blessed hope you have given us. And oh Lord, what a wonderful sense of your presence we're enjoying today. Lord, help us, guide us, direct us, fill us, Lord, to overflowing. And just help us to show Jesus. May everyone who comes around us through this week, Lord, just see and want what we have. And give us the ability, Lord, to share that in whatever way we are able to physically, Lord, help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.